that that stops me from having to take so many notes, which is a good thing. Yep. So let me of course. put my questions down here so I can be looking at you. Um, what do you expect from marketing? So maybe I'll do just a little bit about my role, and I'm not sure how much you know. So yep. um, All I know I, is I'm the chief science officer, so that would be really helpful to me. Well, I'm actually the chief applied science officer. There's a, sem- a different person who's the chief science officer. So the way we've structured the science and lab end of things is that there's a the science uh, strategy, which is to innovate and commercialize new discoveries, genomic tests, really advanced tests that don't currently exist except in our imaginations. Sure. And we're going to do the trials and work with academic institutions to commercialize science. And there is a chief science officer, his name is Chand Khanna, and Chand is, that's his wheelhouse, and he's a world-renowned scientist, and he's leading that effort. Um, the other related effort is the laboratories, and so we have a reference laboratory in San Diego, which we've had for five-plus years, and we replicated that in Boston. Uh, that opened a year ago, and we are we just got the green light to open another lab in our Wheat Ridge Hospital in Denver. We have the vision that we could be a national lab company. Right now, there are two public companies. Well, VCA was public; they're no longer public, um, and IDEX that have about 95% market share across the country. So it's a true duopoly. And we think there's room for a third national player. And so we've talked about us possibly becoming that. So we have two possible trajectories for the lab. One is to continue doing what we're doing, where we have low growth, organic growth in our regional markets, we deploy a lab in other ethos hospitals where where there's a large host hospital and a good metropolitan sure. market. Um, the second um, is a go big strategy where we really go big and we 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 want to create a presence and market share in areas where there are no ethos hospitals. So, for example, um, the East Coast. So, could we? have market share in New York and Washington, D.C., and Miami and Atlanta and, and or on the West Coast, uh, go up the coast of California, so forth. So that's that's the go big strategy. Um, and so my role is I'm in charge. I lead the lab efforts, and I work with Sean on the science efforts. Okay. That's why I've got this weird title that we made up. It makes perfect sense. So it means that you're the business person. You're the you're the person who's trying to monetize the science. That's right, and and grow the lab. So that and there's a lot of synergism because everything we do in science will be, be deployed through the lab. Okay. So if we create a test that's going to diagnose cancer just with a blood test, that'll be delivered through and distributed through our lab. So is there a critical decision point coming then? as to whether to grow organically or to go big. and Yes, uh, we're getting very close to making that decision. Okay. Uh, By the way, to grow organically, we call it the putz along strategy. <laughs> yeah. Of- yeah. Um, is it a zero-sum game market, meaning if you grow, you have to take some from the duopoly that's there? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, and so it, it's, we're battling for market share. Right, so it, it really comes down to do we have a distinctive competence here where we deserve, we will earn market share from them because DVMs will recognize the difference? Yes. Okay. And so we've got to create those differentiators. We've got to somehow market those differentiators, develop a sales force that's able to communicate those differentiators. Yeah, it's uh, you know, I, I laugh with people. I tell them this is not the, the field of dreams. If we build it, they will not come. So yes. you've got to do something a little bit more than that, though. I used to work with a VP of engineering who said, I have a uh, dream of fields. If they come, I will build it. But uh, <laughs> in in this case, yeah, I think there is 
you, there will definitely be a role for marketing in terms of building brand awareness, right? So I've, I've tried to disabuse the marketing team out of using the word branding because it, it's just, it's very confusing and there's no such thing. You either, you build brand equity and there's four types of equity, brand equity. There's brand awareness, which a lot of the hospital brands came with. And the question becomes is how do you transfer that to ethos with the sub brand underneath it? There's brand loyalty, which again, the hospital groups came with, and we want to transfer that equity into the ethos equity. Uh, there's brand loyalty. Again, the hospital groups came with that. We want to retain that equity and this perceived quality. So I think in the case of your new reference lab, it is the issue that we have to build brand awareness because nobody will have heard of it. Right. Okay. Yes, uh, that's it. That's probably the most fundamental need. And then, and then we've got to, what was the fourth one? Yeah, Build brand. Actually, it's brand attributes, which is the one I forgot. Um, oh. you know, if you think about AT&T, uh, they were never successful in computers, nor was Xerox. And the reason is, is they had such strong brand attributes for phones and photocopiers that could never overcome that brand equity of, you know, brand, brand attributes. And so for you, I think the reference lab, we, ha we need to tie science. Science has to be part of the brand attributes of ethos. Everybody has to get it that you're tied. And the reference lab actually provides evidence and reinforces that part of the brand equity. That yeah, I agree. That, that, that's kind of how we think. Good. Um, so maybe the brand awareness and brand attributes is communicating those concepts to the world. It. Yep. Um, and then if we can get that place in people's brains, if I need this, it's the ethos reference lab. That's, that's mana. That's, that's yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you're a, a, the way I would view it, if you're a vet, uh, a GP vet and you want to submit lab work, you want to submit it to a lab that's going to, where you view lab work as a commodity or do you want to send it to a lab where you're getting really cutting edge quality science and science and, um, um, you know, more nimble company. I mean, we could probably come up with other differentiators, yep. but it is, it is fundamentally, it's a red ocean. It's a, uh, we, we have not created any blue ocean idea yet. Okay. But you know, as long as you can differentiate, right. As long as it's not a me too. And you can say, no, truly we've got some innovative science and we've got quality uh, there's a reason for us, there's a place for us in the market. If you look at, um, you remember when Amex and UPS, they had a dominant share and you would have thought, boy, nobody's going to come in and do overnight. And oddly enough, there really wasn't a big differentiation in the product, right? The U.S. Postal Service can deliver overnight. The difference is, is FedEx is a machine, right? So their, their differentiator is their discipline, their process, their formula. I get the wrong people's mail all the time. I never get the wrong package from FedEx, but DHL managed to get themselves into the market. And they did it by saying, we're not going to differentiate on the product. We're going to differentiate on customizing. We're going to have a customer relationship. You want it picked up on Friday at 3.35 p.m. and put in a blue box, we'll do that. And we'll only do business to business. And they actually got themselves into the market that way. So the question for the reference lab is, okay, we can differentiate on product leadership. That's, it's, it's easy. You know, it's, the science is hard, but the marketing is easy for that. It's, it's very clear just as long as the entire company actually invests in product leadership, right? So Intel, you remember Intel used to be Intel inside and they were product leaders in microprocessors. And about 10 years ago, their microprocessors weren't product leading. AMD was beating them and all of their partners left them except Dell. Because they had nothing else. They weren't great at customer experience. They weren't cheap, right? It was all about being product leaders. And if you weren't product leaders, you were nothing. And so in your case, in Ethos case, it is. I mean, I, I get the values and all of that. It's about innovation. You have it in your values. And so people are hopefully measured on it and gold on it. It's the live stream of having eight of the world's top 250 oncologists. It's that sort of mentality. And we've got to bring that out in the reference lab so the brand attributes of ethos flow right down into that. Yeah. Well said. I, uh, 
Cool. I didn't have to tell you you got it. Well, that's what marketing should be doing for you. So when this happens, you know, marketing, but it also means now I'm going to bring it back to our conversation today. Part of the power of building brand equity is consistency. Across the company, there's a consistency. We all adhere to the same company values because those values translate into value propositions and value to the customers. And it, it, it's a promise. A brand is a promise. It says I'm going to behave exactly as you think I'm going to behave. Whether I buy a Mercedes or I buy Coca-Cola or I go into a McDonald's store. And so right, right. Logo appears to be sticking out a little bit compared to the rest of the organizations in that the brand – it appears that you're trying to retain the old brand that was San Diego and resisting a little bit the ethos brand. I, I've um, taken that. Um, I, I've believed in that. You can give me your opinion that in our local market, ethos has no brand awareness, n- none of the attributes that you described. Understood. Um, it's all veterinary, especially hospital. Um, people, we're so well known in the market, the market leaders for quality, market leaders for medical um, innovation. Um, we, we we do all of that. And ethos, it's not like ethos is has the cachet of Mayo Clinic. Agreed. Um, Understood. Ethos, and in fact, in my opinion, corporate veterinary medicine is viewed by most people as somewhere along a spectrum between neutral and negative. Hmm. There's not one person who views, no, one, not one client, not one veterinarian who views a corporate owned practice as being good for anything other than the owner's pocketbook. Yep. So um, why would you want to diminish the, uh, the, um, the brand attributes with adding a corporate moniker to it. Um, and people don't come here to VSH and our specialty hospital and probably never will because of the ethos name unless or until ethos has a, a cachet like a Mayo clinic or an MD Anderson or somebody like that. But if if you were to say um, you're using that metaphor, we're now at a, a United Healthcare Hospital. No one that's not a positive or tenant healthcare. That that's not viewed as a positive by anybody. Yeah. No. So you say unless you say, unless it's a Mayo Clinic or something of that ilk, it's somewhere between neutral and negative. Yeah. If adding ethos or promoting ethos above. The local brand reduced the brand equity, right? Reduced brand awareness, reduced brand attributes. Then, yeah, that would be bad for business. So the question becomes is how over time do we position ethos as not the big corporate entity, as in fact an organization run by doctors nationwide, you know, it's operated by doctors, run by doctors. It's not a nameless corporation and it puts science first and they're combining their collective powers to actually have some sort of synergy. I know that's an overused marketing word, but it, it, you know, otherwise you wouldn't have come together if there wasn't a synergy that the, the sum of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Well, viewed as an economic synergy, how do we make it more than, how do we make it a science quality of medicine synergy? Yeah, agreed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I 100% agree because people won't care if it's an economic synergy. Yeah. Like, but if you said, no, we actually have processes, we share the science, we share this openly, and so we're lifting each other up, these five hospital groups, so that collectively we can advance the science faster. I think that's a great message. And I, I think in turn San Diego could eventually turn around and say, yes, we're great at science, and yes, we're great at serving our local community. And by the way, we have this set of scientists across the country behind us to make us even better. The way I thought of it is, to me, the timing of so, – and, and the lab, by the way, is branded as Stat Lab, which yeah. I think is a terrible name, but it's that's how we've been known in the community for a long time. You know, it, it, it's really hard to get rid of. Once the name sticks, because of brand equity, right, it, it ends up with so much brand equity, like NCR, National Cash Register, 
was that ever a bad choice of names, right? But it's stuck. You know, you just can't change it. Right. Or IBM is probably a bad name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. I can spell it 10 ways to Sunday. It's interesting. You look at the firms like Exxon, E-X-X-O-N, you know, or Xerox, X-E-R-O-X. They make up words which have zero yeah. brand, but they're memorable in some way. And then you give them a brand. So people will forget that StatLab ever meant anything. Maybe it was statistics and laboratory. doesn't matter. It's just a word, and now it has a brand equity associated with it. Yeah. So there, there's been the push by um, the marketing people like uh, Nadia and others to just drop stat and call it ethos diagnostic science. That's mm. And I've resisted that and thought that people use our lab and know it as stat. What, what ethos diagnostic science doesn't mean anything to anybody. It could, um, what, what's the reason to do that locally? I get the reason to do it. If we go into LA, no one's ever heard of stat. Or if we go into any other geographic region, no one's ever heard of stat. But so what's the real reason to drop stat? And I don't see a reason. To me, the re, the timing to do that is when ethos science creates a cancer diagnostic that's really innovative. Yeah. And, 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 and it, then it becomes the Mayo Clinic. Is, is StatLab uh, able to operate independent of all the hospitals? I mean, StatLab is its own business. It is, um, and it's run as its own business, but it's owned by Etho. I mean, it's part of right. Etho. You're getting uh, a lot of but, business sent from the hospitals, no doubt. But yes, and we also have a hundred external clients, meaning referring practices, right. where we are their lab. And uh, yeah. and we have many, many of those practices do not refer to the specialty hospital. They just use our lab. So, so, yeah, where I was going was, you know, at some point, Ethos could be treated as a holding company, and they're merely the owners, but Stat Lab is actually running independently. Possibly. Uh, it, it, there are reasons, other reasons to consider calling it ethos that causes confusion because we are starting to get some national clients for some specialty services. For example, we have a pathologist who is world renowned in cancer pathology and a real luminary pathologist. And we probably have about 10 specialty hospital, non ethos specialty hospitals across the country that use us just for pathology. Yeah. So it's confusing. Do we answer the phone ethos? Do we answer the phone stat? Um, okay. I mean, we, obviously we probably shouldn't solve it here, but ethos stat lab sounds perfectly fine to me. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do. Um, that we we say hello, this is stat lab ethos or ethos stat. What something like that? I, I don't know. Okay. Anyway, but, so, let's, so that, that, that's the battle we're fighting. Yeah. A battle fighting. <laughs> you know, one way or the other, we should resolve it because the battle hurts everyone. And it's like sooner yeah. or later, one side or the other is just going to have to disagree and commit. There's no yeah. disagree and don't commit. It's agree and commit, disagree and commit, but we commit and we just move forward. Yeah. Another example of that battle is on the hospital now, on the hospital, um, across the parking lot. The logo was changed, the ethos logo. So right. the veterinary specialty hospital logo that's been built up as recognizable in the San Diego community for 25 years, it's gone now. It's the ethos logo. And I think that's a mistake. I don't understand what the purpose of that is. Don't they have the sub-brand there? So the specialty hospital brand is still on it? Well, so it says veterinary specialty hospital by ethos. Okay. And then... The veterinary especially had a logo that was a dog and a cat jumping. Um, that logo's gone, and now it's the E, the hexagonal E. Mm. It's the logo. So I, my guess is that was done because there's some type of transition from local branding to national branding. I know you don't like that word, but that's yeah, just yeah. the word. And I just don't understand what the what the purpose of that is. So I'm not fighting that battle because, yeah. But I think it's a mistake. Yeah, it, it, I agree with it. You know, I think you and I can both agree that 
if we come at it from the perspective of how do I preserve the brand equity that I've already earned in awareness and in attributes and in loyalty and in perceived quality. So all four, you know, just rebadging a building, you sort of scratch your head and say, what, what's that accomplishing? Because it's not going to increase brand awareness. No. Uh, at the local level. Okay. We better. Anyway, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, what do you expect from marketing? What did they do for you for StatLab, and what would you expect them to do for you? Is it pens and mugs, or more than that? That's all. We're that's all we're getting now. Um, uh, there's occasionally once a year they'll build a little flyer for us, you know, that we could pass out, or or, or, or we could publish electronically. Uh, there's no zero marketing. Uh, there's no, we we have created our own presence at our meeting. So at the the hospital puts on continuing education meetings, and the lab has a booth, a table. And we do that all on our own. Marketing doesn't have any involvement or very minimal involvement in that. Um, I, 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 the reason I'm blanking on it is because it's, it's essentially zero. Um, I mean, so on your own website, they do that as well. We have our own website that our lab information system built. But I think that with the transition to the new Ethos website, they built a page for us. A page. Uh, uh, well, I, I don't know. I, so uh, I, I have to confess I don't okay. go on the website myself because I don't have a reason to. So I might be underselling the website involvement. There's no social media. There's z- literally zero. Okay. Uh, all the efforts that are being done by marketing for the hospital – None of that, with the sole possible exception of the website, is being done for the lab. So one of the um, first and going that... forward, if we were to, I'd like to increase market share in San Diego County as the minimal goal. So right now we have 25 percent market share. Um, the other two, very large, Antec and Idex, have the other 75 percent. I'd like to expand into region adjacent counties. You might know that not know the geography, but there's Orange County, Riverside County, Los Angeles County. Yeah. That where the veterinary specialty hospital and stat lab really have zero rec- name recog- very little, very little la- name recognition. So we need a plan for that. Well, um, that's the, that's that's the go big. It's amazing. Strategy. Um, but it's not, I'm not I don't and I it probably sounds like I'm complaining cuz but I don't mean to I'm answering your question oh, I'm coming and, across that way you you you're, you're uh, just being straight up straightforward about never, it. We, we've never really said to the organization god damn it we want to grow bigger and faster let's do it um we've we've been okay with this puts a long strategy so far so i mean if all of ethos is 130 million and change in annual revenues what do the stat labs, the three of them, two and a half to three, contribute today? Uh, five million. So you would think at the very least you're getting 4% of marketing's time, but it sure sounds to me like you're getting next to 0% of marketing's time. I would say that's true. Um, uh, the, the, on the, by the way, the national opportunity is very large. Um, if you the, – the Antec and IDEX, these two big companies, yeah. their revenues – in aggregate is about a billion dollars in round numbers. So if we could get 5% market share nationwide, that's $50 million. It's not a small number. And let me give you some stats. For firms who are smaller starting up and want to gain market share, they usually fund marketing in the 10 to 12% of revenues range. For oh, wow. firms that are well established, been around a long time, it's closer to 6 to 7%. And where ethos is today is between one and one and a half percent. And are those numbers true for um, service business versus manufacturing? It just doesn't matter. Yeah, all in. It's just a, it's an average across all industries. So if our goal was to get to a hundred million 
you would say we're we're going to have to put in 10 million just for marketing. Yeah, you absolutely yeah. because you're going to have to build up that awareness. You have to create the collateral. You have to feed the channel. I mean, you have to feed the BDMs. Uh, you know, somebody you have to do the data work. It's just yeah. a lot of heavy lifting. What's a BDM? A uh, business development manager. So oh. your your business development people. Yeah, yeah. And they need feeding and caring. They're they're not going to make up their own stuff. Yeah. Um, so uh, is there a burn rate for a BDM as well? Like in a, in a, a sales team. So like if we're putting ten percent, let's say in marketing, are we putting X percent into sales or? Uh, yeah, you would. In fact, it's even more. You spend more in sales. I, I don't want to call them sales because you're not traditional in that sense. Yeah. Right. In that you don't have sales. Right. You drive referrals from from doctors and. Marketing ends up doing a lot of recruiting as well, by the way, which is very unusual. So I could argue that you really even need more marketing budget because you're spending so much time doing recruiting to fill the hospitals. Um, the BDMs would typically be like 2 or 3%. You know, the idea of having one BDM for a $30 million hospital organization seems way understaffed. I mean, to me, it's just, yeah. it just seems out of proportion. But then your business is unusual. Because, you know, a lot of it is recurring revenue, but somebody has to manage those relationships. It's not just all doctor to doctor. It's also the business development people with these various clinics and hospitals. What about business development for a new entity? So, as you said, for um, 10% for marketing. Yes. Um, if we wanted to grow to be a 50 million or 100, let's say 100 million, is that 30, 3% become? Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, there's no doubt in my mind that the question you probably uh, will face is, do you get your own business development manager for all of the stat labs? And I would say that's a better idea than trying to use the business development managers who today are spread out into their geographies. And, you know, for their role in supporting the hospitals, that makes sense. But when it comes to supporting the vertical services like a vet bloom or yourselves, then it actually makes more sense to say we need a BDM because they have to learn your business. They have to learn what you're offering, what makes you different. And so if there's every reason, because they're on the phone, that they can work at a national level. They don't have to be regional. Right? Cause what about for marketing? Do you, is the same thing? Do you, would you build a structure? Maybe you don't know yet, but no, would you I, build a structure whereby marketing, had, the verticals have their own marketing team? Yeah. Or do so we I, just... Yeah, we're going to give the report to Brian and Naja in two weeks. So it, it, we're down the path in terms of thinking what's the, what should the structure be. And yesterday I sent Nadia, um, I sent her a job description for a product marketing manager. I said the first hire you need to do is go get product marketers because you don't have any. The team that you have are not product marketers. There is a product marketer. So a product marketer is somebody who truly understands the services in your case. They would understand. So if I just, if I said we have one just for stat lab and I don't think that'll be possible economics wise, but you may get half of one or a quarter of one, but it's somebody who would absolutely understand your competitors and what you do and how we're going to get some of that market share and what literature we need to produce and who we need to go influence, who are the targets and what we should say to them in order for them to send business to the stat labs. And so they're going to be driving the creative team to say, go create this, create this. They'll drive the web team to say, here are the pages I need on the website, and here are the search terms you have to go after because that's what these doctors will be looking for. And so they become the expert in the service, and they do what we call merchandising. They know how to take the product, the thing the scientists have made, and go, I'm going to merchandise this. I'm going to take this to market and make sure all the right people get to see it and they know why they should buy it. I'm, I'm an expert in the pain points. What is the challenges they face? What's, what's going on in their heads? Empathy for those doctors who've been sending their, their little diagnostic tests off to those other labs for years. And they know that, to your earlier point, they know the quality is poor or it's inconsistent or they may not trust the results. And that product marketer knows how to speak their language without being a scientist or a doctor and can turn around and write collateral and write messages and get social media and all of that going to make those people, wow, say, I should be looking at Stat Lab for this from now on. And then they can tee up the BDMs. They will train the business development reps to say, when you get on the phone with one of these doctors, 
here's what's going on in their heads, and here's the questions you should be asking them to get them to finally consider Stat Labs. So that's what they do. It's a product right. marketing manager, yeah. yeah. And, and that's a different, and that's a, the person who does that for the lab is certainly a different person than does it for the hospital. Yeah, it's, it, you know, you can spread them, right? The average product marketing manager would have multiple, quote, product services, but you can't have them do, you know, 150 different things. They'd become an expert in nothing. Yeah. So, they're going to want to specialize in a few areas. So, I, you know, if I were to project out two years from now, you will probably have, especially if you're growing your business, you'd have your own product manager. I think the the learning, continuing education, uh, Vet Bloom would probably have a product manager, and then the hospital operations. If there's enough consistency, I mean, I know some of them have more allergies, more services than others but you probably have at least one product manager. You may end up dividing geographically, although there's no good reason to unless the services were totally different from one coast to another. They're not. They're, they're the same. Um, um, it, it's, you know, my dad was a, a GP, general practitioner doctor, and I'd say when he graduated medical school in the 30s, there was probably two or three specialties. You know, you become a GP, you become a surgeon more or less, right? And you think about medicine now, there's hundreds of specialties before you graduate. Yeah. Well, the same yeah. applies to marketing. In the last 10 years, it has gone insane. And so the people who are experts in inbound and social know nothing about outbound and email, who know nothing about uh, brand equity and messaging, who know nothing about building websites. And so you have wow. all these specialties in marketing. So product management, totally different than demand generation. And they're not going to know anything about their own fields. And this idea that you can apply one person who knows pins and mugs and, you know, labeling, branding, um, that's just not that's not how it works. Yeah, gotcha. Could a product manager for the lab also do the compounding pharmacy? Because that was yeah. one strategy yeah. we thought to sell both of those. Things. I think so. Yeah. I, I, and that's going to be in our recommendations. There's enough okay. similarities because I don't think the economics are there to say get one for just stat lab, get one for compounding. We're going to hire one, maybe two in 2018, and I, that's how I would logically divide them. I'd give one to the hospitals, one to the, the labs, and then we'd have to talk about whether or not uh, Vet Bloom Learning and Development gets one or gets part of one and which one actually works with them and how does that work. Yeah. Um, gotcha. But there's also going to be demand generation people, right? So the team that are there today are what we would consider field marketing. They tend to be very driven by the hospital operations. Hey, this is the most important quarter in the company's history, and we need you to do this, and we need you to host this event. And so the horizon from operations tends to be 30 to 90 days, whereas marketing has to have a planning horizon of six months to a year. There's a lot of not urgent, but very strategic things that need to be done. How do we increase our presence on the web? How do we get more people finding us? Because if they're looking, we want to be found, because that makes them really great people to engage with. And you don't fix website issues and become search relevant. You know, you can't fool Google. The days of trying to fool Google are over. You actually have to be true to your roots and to your values and get real content up there. How do we get the DVMs in all the hospitals to produce content? Because marketing is not going to become a subject matter expert. So there's a lot of issues to solve. Okay. Um, well, that makes total sense. And um, even as recently as a few days ago, our executive team, we discussed carving out the verticals as a separate business, literally creating a separate company, Nuco. Maybe it would be called Ethos Verticals or yeah, stupid name, something um, which would include the lab and the pharmacy and plus or minus vet bloom. I mean, the question I would have a couple of questions on that strategy. One is if there was ever a plan to spin them out or sell them off, you know, so that's why holding companies a lot of times won't touch it. Right. They know that at some point they're going to spin it back out five years hence. But if you're buying and integrating these organizations because they add to the value, because there truly is a synergy for the science, and there's no plan to spin them out. And if it furthers the brand equity of ethos, if, if the fact that it actually builds the awareness, it builds the attributes of we're investing in science, and it builds loyalty because it's a brand you trust, 
then yeah, you keep it the same name. It's like Four Seasons, right? Four Seasons has great brand equity. It, you know, people go to Four Seasons because they know they will be treated exactly the same. Service is unbelievable. It's expensive, but there would no be no reason for Four Seasons to buy a hotel or a resort somewhere and give it a different name, it, right? That right. it adds. So you have that question to ask yourself, which is what, why why do we own this business? Well, one of the reasons we thought carving it out as a separate business would be to facilitate having uh, equity ownership by other groups. There's another specialty group. Um, it's called MedVet. That yeah, yeah. Is, uh, probably one of the more well-respected, and they're very interested in getting involved with the lab, And but they would only do it if they had some sure. kind of equity ownership. And That makes perfect sense. Okay, I get that. Okay, let's go back to the regular program. Um, so I think, you know, based on what marketing isn't doing for you, I kind of already have a good idea what marketing can do for you next year. It can do some product marketing. It can create a lot of collateral. Uh, it can really help you promote the business and get the brand awareness that you need, as well as giving people the tools to actually sell it. Um, is there any, once you have a, a referring physician, uh, you call DVMs physicians as well, right? No, not really. Or DVMs. Or okay. vets, vets or veterinarians or DVMs. Gotcha, vets. Once you have um, a vet who's referred once, is it likely they will refer again? To the lab or yeah, to the to hospital? The to the lab. Uh, usually what happens is after multiple conversations, they agree to become your client, and then you get all their business. And changing labs is – a major thing that's painful. It's you don't just go back and you don't just flip right. off. It's yeah. not like sending your package to FedEx today and let's you UPS tomorrow. So uh, does that mean it, that the lab has to be holistic in the sense that it has to cover eighty or ninety percent of the needs of the organization that's referring to it? Yes. Okay. Uh, actually, no, a hundred percent of the needs. A hundred percent. Okay. They really don't want to have to mess around with going to anybody else for any special no. test. No, they want to take their blood, their biopsies, they put it in a bag and have our courier pick it up and any test they want, we do. But and if we don't, that doesn't mean we have to do it in San Diego. We'll send some of the esoteric things to Cornell or to or to Michigan State, but yeah, we do that. The next question, yeah, which was, is there a geographic element to Stat Lab? So if we're promoting it, is it really within the counties, that area that's going to refer to it, or can you promote it? No, now? so we would just have to create a logistics plan. So if we said we're going into Seattle, we just have to figure out how to get a courier to pick up the blood from all the vets in Seattle, get it on a plane, and get it to San Diego that night so we can have it done by the next day. Gotcha. So the presence the really – By the way, um, yeah. the, the labs work overnight. All, if you walk into a reference lab during the day, it's, it's dead. You walk in at night, and it's oh, that's where all the action is. That's mind-blowing to me. Because it, it seems like when it's human, when we do our test, they say it'll be back in three weeks. It's like you're doing it overnight. Oh, if, we, if if a veterinarian doesn't have the blood panel on his desk, her desk, in the morning when they walk in, you failed. Wow. I like this. Yeah. Um. By the way, I'm sure that that's the way it's done in human medicine, too. You just don't get – your doctor just doesn't call you the next day. He I'm gets having a different doctor. conversation next time I go in, let me tell you. Uh, that, that both results are there. You just don't get the call. So when you, uh, you're you rolling, you said you're rolling out a new uh, stat lab. So with with the existing marketing, minimal help you have, what's your go-to-market? What's your strategy for building business for that stat lab? Um, well, in Boston, we've assumed that and, and we're going to go to the external market. We're hoping by January, we're hoping that the marketing and business development teams are going to do our marketing and business development. Okay. But it's it, if if uh, and it can't be the way San Diego is done. Um, we don't want we 
it's unacceptable to the organization to grow at the pace that we've grown so far in San Diego. Gotcha. So if we're going to replicate the San Diego model and grow at that rate, that would be a, a failure. So we've got to create a plan yeah. to have marketing and business development in all of our markets. And um, I, I'll, the, 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 that's even in the putz along plan, we need way more than what we're doing now. But I, am reasonably comfortable that the organization is going to commit to a go big plan. Okay. It is, they want to. I mean, so we, and then we really need, as, the, yeah. as you described, all those things. Yep. It is, this is good that we're having the conversation because, I mean, we have to factor that into the 2018 plan. So yeah. the 5 million that you have 2017, what's that going to grow to in 2018? Um, if, if I have my way, it's going to probably, and we go into markets that we don't currently have, it's, um, it could be in the 10 to $20 million range. And then in 2019, it, we should have the infrastructure to grow and you know, take 5% okay. of the national market. Within the existing properties, can you grow to deal with that load of work, or do you have to open up more new locations? We would just have to uh, expand um, in the building that we're in. Oh, okay. We'd have to we'd have to get more analyzers. We'd have to get more staff. We'd right. have to get capa- more pathologists. And there's a a number. It, it's I don't know if this is a chicken or egg kind of question. That do do we grow to be that big and then hope the and then turn the marketing this dev teams loose and they make it happen or do we tell the market and this dev team go go at it and as the business comes in we'll figure out how to grow we do the latter no no question i mean otherwise yeah. you just burn too much cash and that's not good i would okay. rather that we make marketing coin operated you put a quarter in you get a dollar out and you can measure it and you know exactly how long it takes. So in other words, if you're going to go into a new market and you're going to expand, you say, if I start marketing this in March, I'm going to have to hire a new pathologist in July. You know, what's the length of time? What does it take? How, you know, how long does it take to build that curve and how ramp? Because I doubt that it's ever going to be, you know, straight up. It's going to gradually grow. And we figure out what are all the marketing things we have to do to grow it from social to website to working with the BDMs to just start calling doctors. How do we gradually build that book of business? And but it's got to be predictable. Yeah. And then yeah. that way, you know, if you do it in a region, let's say you decide, yep, we're going to go into Seattle and we do it in a region and we sit back and look and go, okay, this is what the curve looked like. So if we're going to go into Portland next month, we know exactly what that's going to do and how much we have to invest and when we get the return. What's our time to value? Okay. Um, top priorities for the coming year? Grow the business? Yep. That's number one. Okay. We, we're, we, you know, our priorities for 2017 were probably, I would say, build the team, um, really hone in on quality, um, what we call QA, QC, quality assurance, quality control, which is yep. that when – the lab result you get back is accurate all the time, every time. Absolutely. Um, so that that um, we're, we're at that point where we just we've got the formula down, and we just need to uh, turn the marketing business teams loose. Yep. Uh, I mean, what people have to understand is science has come back into marketing. And so in the same way that your hospitals are operations and they're scientific and your stat lab is scientific, we can actually be scientific about marketing. We can see what we invest. We can see what's working. We can see what's not working. We can stop doing the stuff that's not paying the returns and do more of the stuff that is giving good returns. And just like evolution, it's a, you know, it's a curve that goes up very fast if you invest in the things that are working properly. Just another, but another top priority for us is recruiting that we haven't cracked the code on that. Mm. Um, so we've struggled in Boston getting lab techs there. We've grown um, much slower than we wanted to in Boston because we just don't have 
the, the technicians to run the blood. And so we need to figure out mm. that if we're going to, so if we're going to quadruple in size, we need, we need to crack the code on recruiting. Is that, and I know you, it was actually surprised me. Linda and Brian separately said recruiting is almost as important as referring DVMs as a, something that marketing does. Would you agree with that? Brian have focused 100% so far virtually on recruiting doctors, specialists. Mm. I'm talking about recruiting right. technicians. We'll have no problem recruiting pathologists. I'm sure of that. Um, it's it's the, the technicians and the um, okay. you know that yeah, that's talked, yeah I talked to Jared Katz yesterday which was a great conversation and he he absolutely said yeah a big part of the job is recruiting the technicians although they try to recruit those locally whereas the doctors are usually going to relocate yes that's yeah for sure that's true uh, but yeah. But, it's, uh, probably means for your technicians it's a zero sum game as well, meaning you're pulling you want somebody with experience so you're pulling them out of your competitors. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and this again goes back to brand equity uh, attributes, brand equity, why do they want to work for ethos? What does it mean? What's the culture? I had one person tell me that they felt the culture of the different hospitals in different parts of the country was sufficiently different that the messaging, the ethos messaging would actually change from, let's say, San Diego to uh, the Northeast. I think that's true. I think that there are cultural differences. Um, I think just the mere fact that I have a local branding um, type of mindset, that's very different than what their mindset is in the East, that their national branding I think the decision making is different in the East versus the West. Mm. Uh, so there, and it's not better or worse. It's just different. Right. Right. Both, both, both are successful. Um, so if the ethos messaging in the East, um, about decision making and how we are part of a larger organization is a different message than in the West. Yeah. I think, I mean, I'm hoping we can find a middle ground that says, we're a doctor-led, doctor-run company, and it's about the science, and we can all agree on that. And then there's think, a small amount of messaging changes on top of that, but it's not huge. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I don't have any other questions for you. Do you have any questions for me? Um, no, I, I might have at some point because we're uh, we're about to build out a national lab footprint pro forma and trying to get an idea of the investment dollars yeah. that we'll need. Just the mere fact that this 10% figure um, and, may, and um, 2 to 3% for BizDev, but probably ramping that up in the beginning, I think that's really helpful so we can plug that in. Yeah, and I think the other thing on the um, marketing dollars, a good marketing organization, uh, their budget is half labor and half program dollars. Program covers, you know, creating the literature, going to events, all of the non-labor related money. So, you know, don't invest 70% in labor and only 30% in the stuff because you'll have people twiddling their thumbs. So Most, was that 10%, 10% or 5%? 5%, 5%. 5%, 5%. Yeah, that was the total marketing budget. Yeah, so like in the old days when I was doing layoffs, I always cut an equal number of programs and people. So you keep yeah. that balance of 50-50 because... You know, it's tempting, right, when you're doing layoff to keep the people and cut the program dollars, and it just doesn't work because the people are sitting there idle and you're not doing any programs, which is terrible. You will have yeah. a lot of literature to produce. You'll probably use outside organizations for copywriting or for creating graphics or doing websites. So there, there's dollars that are going to go outside other than labor. Yeah. But, yeah, keep it 50-50 in the pro forma. If we do build out a national lab, it, it, it's almost like we're creating new co because well, what we have in San Diego is so small compared to what we picture growing into in the next year or two. Do we hire uh, a chief marketing person? Um, uh, how how do we? Or, or yeah, you're small uh, enough. I wouldn't. I would certainly not give that title away easily. I would hire, uh, you know, at most a director. 
but you, you want someone who's going to roll their sleeves up, right? You, because you're small enough, you don't want to be bringing in great management and there's nobody to do the actual work. So yeah. I, I would, th- you know, management is going to be the problem when you have three, four, five people who really need a leader to keep them focused together. And so I would be hiring the Indians first, not the chiefs. Okay. So bring gotcha. in, you know, the product marketing manager, bring in the demand generation person, you know, and you can outsource some stuff until it gets so big that you say, okay, now it's more economical to bring it in. Cause you've got little bits of all these different skill sets and finding somebody who's brilliant and all these different things will be hard. So you'll end up outsourcing like, this is why we, like you probably outsource payroll, right? There's no reason for ethos to become an expert in the tax laws for 50 states. There's no value to your clients. Well, there's going to be good reason to outsource things like copywriting or doing graphics because you don't need them seven by 24. Or if the day comes where, yep, you can keep a graphic artist busy all the time, and that's where national will probably do it and essentially give that resource, you know, with ticketing systems out to all of the businesses. It's like, yep, National can afford to have one brilliant creative artist. That's all they do. And we have a ticketing system set up so you can get a slice of that person's time. That's right. And the budget really should come from you. You know, that that's the other way. I, I like putting marketing budget close to the revenue so that the people who are gold on making revenue, like a product marketing manager, they get the budget. And then they turn around and say to National, I'm going to give you $100,000 to create these seven pieces of collateral for me or, or this website, but I have the budget and the control, and I decide how my money is spent with you. You're a service. Not the other way around where National says, sorry, I don't have any bandwidth to work on your project. Like, no, no, that's not how it works. Yeah, All right. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. One last question. Is your – company you and your company's engagement limited to giving us this plan and structure or are you going to be um, available as a consultant so when we get deeper into the national lab strategy you we you'd be available for consulting and our plan is to help you do it and eventually i mean you should be able to for the most part have the machine and run it all by yourself but uh in working with brian and naja it's like no we're we're going to be here and we'll, you know, there's certain things you should hire. You know, don't depend on us for everything. That's not a good idea. Because yeah. they're going to learn so much about you and your business, you want them inside the organization, right? So like a product manager, you know, don't come to us for a product marketing manager. You really should hire that. Um, okay. But there's other things like demand gen and putting in some of the technology, pulling the data all together, you know, trying to, you know, get five HIS systems down to one and then connect it with, a CRM, a customer relationship management system for the BDMs, and a marketing system, that'll take one to two years. We're going to help in all of that. We'll help train the people. We'll help put the best practices in place. We'll help with the messaging and all of that good stuff. Yeah, and, you okay. know, if you wanted creative, I mean, we can contract out the copywriters and all of that for you. You can contract them out or the creatives. You know, that's a no-brainer. Okay. Yep. No, we're here for the journey. It's all about the journey. All right. Good. Great talking to you. Yeah, pleasure. It was really uh, helpful to me to uh, learn a lot just in this hour, so that's great. Me too. Yep. It's going to be a good plan, and uh, we'll we'll grow the business. All right. Cool. All the best. Thanks. Bye now. Bye-bye.